And protanum biochemically is a NERF2 activator. Well, that probably didn't tell you a lot more than you knew before I said that. But what a NERF2 activator is, it's something that delivers a biochemical wake-up call to every cell in your body. That's what protanum does that's important, and I want you to understand how it does that. So here is how protanum works really in one single slide. This big blue oval represents any one of the several trillion cells in your body. And in the upper right, you see that little purple item labeled protandum. That's one of the five active ingredients in protandum. And so every cell in your body, if you take a protandum, will be bathed in those molecules that make up protandum. The first thing protandum does when it approaches a cell is it binds to a receptor on the cell. And what is that? Well, if this cell is your house, what protandum just did is it stepped on the front porch and it rang your doorbell, right? That's how the cell interprets that. When that happens at your home, things happen inside. You may get up off the couch and walk to the door to open the door and see who's there. When protandum rings the doorbell of this cell, something happens inside. That oval labeled a kinase, a kinase is an enzyme, it's a protein that catalyzes a particular metabolic reaction. It's activated, just as the chimes inside your house are activated when protandum or someone steps on your front porch and rings the doorbell. Something happens inside. What that particular enzyme does, the one that just turned yellow, is it modifies a protein inside the cell. The, the, the protein that's modified is represented here by the little red oval labeled NRF2, NERF2. NERF2 is what biochemists call a second messenger. And to go back to the doorbell analogy, maybe your four-year-old runs to the door, opens the door, and turns around, runs to the kitchen, and says, Mommy, Mrs. Smith's at the front door. That's a second message, all right? So Mrs. Smith rang the doorbell, and something happened inside your house that sends a message. Protandum does exactly the same thing. If you look at this uh, red protein, it now has a little yellow circle with a P on it. That P is a phosphate group. So chemically, the red protein has been modified. It's been held in the cytosol, the, the main space of this cell, by a blue protein called KEEP1 that's holding it there, preventing it, if you will, from running into the kitchen. So maybe this is in the family room. But once it's been modified as a result of protandum ringing the doorbell, that modified NERF2, that second messenger, is now free, and it leaves the blue protein that's been holding it, and it finds its way to the part of the cell where the DNA is stored. And the DNA is really the central blueprint that controls everything you are, everything your body can produce. And NERF2, chemically modified, released, running to the, to the room where the DNA is stored, so this is your four-year-old running into the kitchen, delivers a message to the blueprint that really runs this cellular household. The DNA is comprised of 25,000 genes, and they are blueprints that make every protein in your body, every enzyme in your body. This second messenger, NERF2, has been called the master regulator of survival genes. Survival genes are stress response genes. They enable the cell to get through tough times. Some of them are antioxidant enzymes, and we've talked about those from the beginning. When protandum started, what we thought it would do is upregulate, make more of two specific enzymes. And at the last Elite Academy, I showed you what we now understand about how it works and what it does. Protandum upregulates at least 400, maybe closer to six or 800 enzymes, not just the two we were originally interested in. 
among those enzymes are survival genes of all kinds, not just helping you to survive oxidative stress, but helping you to survive traumatic stress. Cells get injured, they respond, organs get injured, blood vessels get injured. Today we're going to be talking about what happens when blood vessels are injured, and they can be injured by well-intentioned surgeons and physicians, and they respond in ways that can create problems for us. Problems not related to the original disease, but problems related to, to what happens next. When this messenger gets to the DNA, it finds every gene in the nucleus that's regulated by a certain kind of switch. Here it's labeled ARE. That's a switch. Every gene has a switch, just like a, every light fixture in your house has a switch. And the genes are expressed, their products are produced as that switch is sort of like a dimmer switch. As you turn it up, you get more production. You turn it down, you get less production from that particular blueprint. So protandum ringing the doorbell results in a reshuffling of those 25,000 blueprints in the nucleus of the cell. Hundreds of new gene products are produced or more of them are produced. For another couple of hundred, they're turned down. Some of those are pro-inflammatory genes. They promote the inflammatory process. They're pro-fibrotic genes that cause scar tissue to be formed. So it's really a, a normalization in many cases, a readjustment of all the instructions being sent to that cell. That's what protandum does. That's how it works. The result is the upregulation or the increased production of all these protective enzymes called survival genes. This is a figure from the very first paper we published on protandum, and I'm coming back to this because it also relates in what I'm going to tell you today about heart disease. Here we're looking at a marker of oxidative stress, one of the most sensitive kinds of molecules in your body to oxidation is polyunsaturated fatty acids. Those are the things that make butter. Uh, it's a fat. It makes the membranes that hold your cells together. And if, if you leave a stick of butter on the table for a few days, it becomes rancid. It's interacting with oxygen. It's oxidized by oxygen. And it turns into a whole new set of products. Some of them are not tasty. Some of them don't smell very good. That's what we call rancidity, or rancid butter. And the same thing happens to the polyunsaturated fatty acids throughout your body when faced with oxidants, with free radicals. Here we're measuring that marker of oxidative stress in the blood of healthy people ranging in age in this study from 20 years old to 78 years old. And they're scattered around that line but the line is a mathematical linear regression line. It's sort of the average thing that happens there. And what you see is it, it goes higher and higher as you go from age 20 to age 80. And some individuals in the Middle Ages in particular are very different from others. So some of us sit on a couch and eat potato chips and watch TV. Others are training for marathons. And it shows in your levels of oxidative stress. Some of us take good care of our bodies, and some of us don't. That's why they're scattered. These people all took protandum for 30 days, and what happened is the levels of oxidative stress went from the red dots to the green dots. And if you look just at the green dots, you now can't really tell the 80-year-old from the 20-year-old. Everybody fell to that same low level of oxidative stress. And that's what we've been saying now for six years. And in this study, oxidative stress was lowered an average of 40%. If you were 78 years old, it went down about 70%. If you were 20 years old, it only went down about 20% because you were starting in a, a better place. All right, and what was measured here is called T-BARS. That's an acronym for 
biobarbituric acid reactive substances, not so important, but those are the oxidized chunks of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So is that relevant? Does T-bars mean anything? This paper was published in 2004, and it says serum levels, blood levels of T-bars, predict cardiovascular events in patients with stable coronary artery disease. And the conclusions down there found that it was an independent marker. It was actually a better predictor of cardiovascular events. I've said before, that's not an event you want to attend. It's not an event like this one. A, a cardiovascular event may be an attack of angina, chest pains upon exertion. It may be a myocardial infarct that takes you to your knees. It may be fatal. So there are a number of kinds of cardiovascular events. The important thing is the higher the T-bars, the more likely a cardiovascular event was to occur.